Okay, so I'm here to talk about the corporate scale engine and mass growth. How many of you have heard about mass growth, the corporate venture capital arm of mass? A few. Okay, then I'll, uh, I'll talk a bit about that. There were, there were not too many hands. Um, what we do... Sorry, I'm trying to wait for this, but it's not working very well. <laughs> okay, I'll go over here instead. I'm too impatient for pointers that doesn't work. Um, so Mask Growth is the corporate venture arm of, of uh, Mask, and we're, uh, we're, our purpose is to create growth in adjacent markets. So we're looking at how we can increase our future revenue by investing in new companies. And we're like a typical corporate venture capital fund, so we invest up till... 20% in equity, and we typically take a board seat or a board of service seat for that. Uh, we invest between $500,000 uh, up to $5 million. Our sweet spot, spot is one to $2 million. So that's the kind of investor we are. But let me elaborate a bit more on why we are here. So this works perfectly. So we're part of a bigger agenda, which many corporations are focused on right now, digital transformation, which is a wonderful word because it doesn't say anything. But it's basically how can we use technology to digitize our businesses so we can cultivate all the benefits of going from what we call slow tech to fast tech. So how can we design through technology, how can we get more intelligence through data, and how can we start to, to utilize new business models? So the big difference in this modern age of uh, this buzzword being in a part of a transformation is that it's very much customer-centric, because we have been optimizing for a few decades, so we have built up silos. We've come pretty much as far as from organizations, from the customer, because we've been focusing so much on, on, on being more efficient. So now the time has come back to many corporations on remembering why was it we were founded, what was the key problem we were solving, and going back to that. What is the pain of our customer, and how can we solve that? And that are there are many ways of doing that. You can do that close to core, and we have a, a lot of talented people working inside the organization, which, which are updating and building the foundation, which is if we have to utilize technology, we have to have a platform that can actually be, be holding that. So building that, that foundation and that platform, and then we have uh, people who are working on digital services and, and customer experiences on, on top of that. But that's how can we improve what we do today? So our purpose is looking a little bit further, and I, when I look at around other companies, they have the same, many have the same approach. You transform in the core, and you transform also in adjacent space, and even some go to the new, totally new areas of, of new revenue streams or business models. But that is the reason why we're hearing this buzzword a lot, because we need to transform the way we think about our market and the way we work in order to leverage value. So it's all about going from, I said, uh, slow tech to fast tech. And slow tech is, is typically when you, when you buy IT to support your assets. So a taxi company would buy a dispatch system to be able to leverage the assets they have and make sure the right drivers go to the right place. Whereas Uber would be a fast tech company because they're designed around technology where the technology is, is in center and then the assets are just uh, enablers. And I think that's what many traditional corporations are trying to build again. It's just super difficult when you don't do it from the beginning. So many of the tech companies, they start with a digital design, whereas traditional companies, they have to take all the assets and all the inherited um, systems into, into place as well. And th that is just a slower process. And the people part of it, you organized for this, so you need to change that as well and change the mindset while doing it. So what we're looking for in, in, in transformations in general in organizations are how can we create new operation? How can we optimize the operation we have through technology? How can we scale through intelligence based on data typically? Are there any new business models that appear? So we might make money on making a transaction, selling a shipment or selling a product, but do we have options on making money in other ways? Can we sell our data? Can we go from a selling commodity to selling services or even being a software company because what we actually have the higher value of is, is, in, is in data or in the, the software we can build rather than the, the original product. So that's what companies are looking at. How can we change the way we make money based on the knowledge and the toolbox we have? 
And then, of course, how can we create new customer experiences? So that's basically efficiency and customer experiences are the two levers of, of, of digitizing businesses today. Either you do it to optimize your operations, or you do it to create new customer experiences. And it's going to affect either the top line or the bottom line. It's pretty much what everyone does, closer or further from the core. And that is the journey we are also on. And why are we doing this in so many different ways? So why are we putting up these CBC arms in, uh, in corporations? Why aren't we just investing from the core? One of the reasons is that organizations as we know them today, in many cases, are incompatible with the changes we see in the market. As I mentioned before, we optimized for our operations, but we didn't optimize for our markets. So we need to transform the way we work to capture the outside-in approach, to capture learnings from the market while running a stable organization. Now, humans are pretty slow when it comes to evolution, so it's not something you just decide and do. It's a human factor, and that takes time. So we, we're seeing organizations evolving and becoming more customer-centric in the way they deliver value. So how can we work across the organization instead of in silos? How can we make sure we focus on customer outcome instead of vertical KPIs that might measure how much we earn or what we do in a specific area, but it's not directly serving the, the, the customer in the other end? So while we're getting this modern organization that can capture profits, but also capture development, think short term and also capture long term strategies, we're seeing these new in initiatives like corporate venture and innovation departments, the project excess of the world, which is small units who are more agile in design, who is a bit further from the core. So we have the luxury of looking on a longer term basis. So that's basically what we're doing. And in the future, we might have a new organization, and you might not need it because we evolved and found a way to capture both short-term, long-term profit, short-term and long-term development as well. What we are very focused on and what is very interesting, and that's what any company is built on. So how many of you are coming from startups? A few. How many from corporations? And what do the rest do? Well, I'm curious about that. OK, maybe freelancers. But anywho, when, when you look at the, a founding company, whether it's a startup or a corporation, it was all, always founded on a vision to improve something. So it was a problem in the market that a visionary founder was solving. And then we start building products, and time flies. And then we forget that the products are merely a symptom of the, of the vision. And a vision is typically, typically connected to that problem. And a startup remembers that because they're, they're, it's very close to their, to their history. So it's, it's something we can remember why we're here. But sometimes we tend to forget that in corporations. But the way to remember it is by being obsessed about customers. And the way to be obsessed about customers is to understand what, it, what are their pain points? What are the problems that they're, they're facing when dealing with us? as a company. So looking after problems, because with every pro problem, there is an opportunity to make something better. There's growth potential. And that's what we're looking for. Problems that are big enough that we can basically build some growth upon. And not only big enough for us as a company, not our addressable market, but the total addressable market. Now, that's the sweet spot we want to find. And I think I'm talking to you from mass growth, or, which is my industry, but I think this is this is generic in any industry. Be curious about problems and how you can solve it and understand the impact of them. The impact might be we can solve a big problem for a customer, but the impact can also be surrounded around growth. And many times, those two worlds are merged. And as I mentioned before, it's, uh, it's all about humans. And I think that's probably the hardest part, is that we talk about these words, transformation, disruption, being agile, failing fast. All these enablers for working in a new way to capture the digital era. But in the, by the end of the day, we as humans, we are defined by our behavior. And our behavior is defined by our norms. And the norms is, is our culture in many ways. So what is the norm of our behavior? How do we act in, in circumstances? So we can't change organizations, so we can't change how we work before we change our culture to support it. And that's what many companies are, are also facing, is that you might make a decision of doing something, but it will take a lot of time before you're actually seeing that through everyone's behavior. So that's another big element of transformation in corporations, is how do we, 
how do we develop the culture that can support that goal as well? Technology is so easy. Humans are difficult. It's always there. It's tough. And as I mentioned, evolution is slow, and we're, we're designed as an incremental species. We weren't designed to turn uh, be 70 or 100 years old. We were designed to die around 30. So we didn't have to be long-term thinkers. We didn't have to think in consequences that reached out of the short term, or further than the short term. We just needed food tomorrow. If we were lucky, we would stay a year more. So we need to force our lizard brain, which won't think long term, to say, OK, I might feel like this is safe to do that right now. But on the long term basis, I need to change the way I work or the way I, I ap approach problems. And I think that's what many of us are facing, that rationally, intellectually, we know it's a good thing to do, but it's really hard to build into our behavior. And that's because we're an incremental species. We're not fond of risk. We prefer business cases that can forecast the future. But radical change cannot be forecasted. That depends on courage, on vision, and on trying and failing and learning and trying again. And that's many times not a part of the human nature. So we need to force that a little bit and embrace it when we see it. And it's not only my industry that is working on a transformation. All industries are being transformed, some slower than others, but uh, it'll happen sooner or later. And our customers, they're ahead of us. They have the best technology. They have the best customer experience at the tip of their fingers. So when they reach out to us, they have high expectations. They're used to ordering a cab by pressing a button. So why does it have to be so difficult to use your product when I see other products being so easy to use? So that's a world we are being benchmarked into regardless of industry and regardless of what we offer. So the winners of this race will be the companies that offer the best customer experience. Those will be the domain differentiators in the future. Now, it would be super nice if this clicker was working. Let's see if it's better now. So if we look at Mask as a company, zooming into the world I'm, I'm representing, we had entrepreneurship in our DNA since we were founded in 1904, back to the story about every founder has a vision and a problem he or she is solving. And that is the DNA and the mindset we're trying to reignite because we, uh, we have forgotten it a little bit the past 10 years, we've been focused on, like everyone else, on optimizing our business. But if you do too much optimization, you many times lose creativity and exploration and agility. So that is what we want to reignite as well as a department. So we have three pillars we're founded on. One is to create new revenue streams for Mask in the future. The other one is to become the home for ideas. So if anyone has a great idea, they can come to us internally or externally. And the third is entrepreneurial nexus. So how can we share some of the ways we are working and some of our learnings with the organization and help them get the entrepreneurial spirit into their DNA again? And we have, I have 80,000 colleagues around the world in 123 countries, so we're pretty global. And uh, we have a lot of history, and I'll just take you through some of the businesses we've done for the past more than 100 years. We've done sugar plantations, we've done whaling, we've done fishing, we've done everything where we saw there was a growth potential. And we've been very good at also closing it down when we could see the profit pool was not, no longer existing or diminishing. So that is basically what we're trying to continue to do. We're also a big company. We have 20% of all trade in the world. So the chance of someone, everyone in this room will be wearing something we shipped. We transport 30% of all world food in the world as well. So if we can see a problem that has a big addressable market, it's not only a good growth potential, but also has impact. But we are on, this, we're on the ocean with our ships, we're on the ports, we have terminals. We also have a little bit on the inland side, so trucks taking the containers from the ships to a warehouse. And then we have Switzer, which is the small tugboats helping the big ships uh, navigate in, in close, shore, close to shore. So it's a pretty big operation, and we have a lot of knowledge and a lot of data in floating through. But ma back to us, mask uh, growth. As I said, we're a CVC, and uh, we, 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 do, we invest in with money, of course, but as a corporate venture capital unit, you are a strategic partner. So you bring what we call rocket fuel, 
So if we can add a multiplier effect by being masked, we won't invest because then any other investor could play a part and they would be better at it. So we're looking for that fit in order for us to play a significant role. And as I mentioned, we have these three pillars. We have the $1 billion businesses we want to create. We have the home for ideas and the entrepreneurial nexus. That is our objectives. That is what we're going to be measured on. But why do we want to invest in the future? Why is it so important? Why can't we just transform the core and it'll happen by itself? If we look at any most organizations, they might have an organic growth goal, but they will probably also have a goal reaching beyond what we can achieve organically. So this is what we're trying to figure out, is if we look three to five or seven years into the future, which profit pools will be available at that time? 50 years ago, it would have been a bit slower and therefore easier, but now technology is just changing the way we do business and the infrastructure and consumer demands and consumer behavior so fast. So we can't just sit and wait and build this incrementally. We need to buy into people who are seeing or at least having some leads into this future. And we could build it ourselves, and we also tried that, but if you want to compete with the world of innovators, you need a lot of money and you need a, need a lot of time and a lot of skills. So that's just not sustainable. It makes sense to build yourself if you have a unique position that no one else can fill out. Then you have that gap where you are the only player because you have the assets of the data. But if anyone in the world is trying to solve a problem we have, it would be better to invest in, in them and follow them in their journey. And we are investing in many leads into this future. So we want to find the next wave of our industry. We don't know the answer, but we're trying to invest in some of the signals, some of the startups that are showing great visions and great progression into what might be our future profits. So is this leap that's so difficult? And if we look back in history, it's not only hard for us, it's always been hard. It was not the horse carriage companies that invented the car, and it was not the car companies that invented mobile, even though it was sitting in the car staring at them. And it wasn't the washboard companies that invented the washing machine. And I could continue because the existing industries are trying to sustain what we do today and just trying to sustain what we've done in the past. And if you're so much focused on that, you sometimes miss the bigger picture that customers are moving somewhere else. So that is also part of the role we play, to see what is happening in the market. Where should we be? Is there a new industry or a new solution or a new trend that we need to follow in order to have a significant presence in the future as well? And we talk a lot about exponential growth. Unicorns, you all heard that. But there's also this element of exponential decay, like we've seen with Kodak, a great company with great inventions. They didn't do anything wrong but they didn't do the right things either. Nokia, and I could continue. So it's not, even though you have a big position, you're, you're not safe. You need to follow the market where the market is and not be too focused on where your business is today. We're also in a very unique time because we've seen a decade or two decades with software development. We had hardware for 30 years, and we had software for 30 years, 20 years, that's been the trends. And now these two worlds are merging, so we want to put the virtual layer over our, our assets and physical world. And our world is physical. That is the biggest part of the globe. And this is the potential we are trying to tap into. If we can make everything intelligent, everything that makes sense, that is intelligent, then we can get data, we can get insights, and through data, we can get artificial intelligence that can support us. We have the fourth industrial revolution, which will change the way we do business and the way we consume radically. And this is, this is the area we need to find a place in, and this is the area we need to make sure we make money on as well. So this is why corporations, the incumbents who has all the assets, we have a unique role to play because it's not only a software game anymore. And it's not only a hardware game anymore. That's commodities today. But if you mix that and put it into a consumer context or a context for your customer, then you have a business potential that's pretty unique. So a little bit about what we invest in. We have two areas. I mentioned that we transport a lot of food, 30% and even 50% in some areas of the world. We're also living in a time where 30% of all food is wasted. And 80% of that happens in our supply chain. So even though you're good citizens at home and continue to be that, sort your garbage, 
The real impact is in the supply chain. And today, we see that if you have a growth potential, you, you would also have an impact potential on the sustainability area. And this is the opportunity we have with Fight Food Waste. So we are investing in startups that are solving some of the root causes to food loss through the, the supply chain. So we are not investing in the too good to goes of the world or other solutions that are merely solving a problem of surplus food or lost food. We're trying to figure out how can we eliminate that is, it becomes a problem. And in 2030, we need 50% more food in the world, and it's really hard to squeeze more out of our globe, so we need to think about the problem in a new way. The other area is future trade, which is pretty broad. But we're tapping into our strategy, with, which is becoming the global integrator of container logistics and services. So we want to become the end-to-end -end integrator of global trade, basically. Not entirely up to the end consumer, but some, somewhere close. And we're investing in new solutions because we're very, very strong on the ocean. We're strong on the terminal supports. We have a little bit on what we call intermodal, so the, 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 the land. We're not in last mile. So what our role is to figure out how can we play a stronger, a stronger role on intermodal and on last mile, where it makes sense, not, as I said, to the end consumer. But how can we make sure we can deliver that end-to-end -end vision in three, five, or seven years? And while the core is doing some of it, there's the building on the business we have today, but we do have business areas that are not in our business yet. So we need to figure out what that will be and invest in those solutions. We invest in stars. And that's all about the teams here. So is it a team that found a problem or a solution to a problem that is scalable? You, everyone who's been an entrepreneur or been close to an entrepreneur, you probably know that ideas are cheap, scaling is hard, everyone can get a great idea. But sometimes it's not important enough for the customer or you can't solve it well enough for the customer. So we're looking at teams that ha has found solutions that are scalable globally, solving something that has impact. We're looking for teams that have, have unique technology and not technology for the sake of it, but technology, technology that is a part of the solution, that has some IP, or have something unique in the way it's addressing the solution or the problem. And then we are looking for ambition. And I think every founder who starts something, they should at least have this burning desire to just conquer the world. And whatever they get of no's, figure out, no, but how can we make this better? instead of being shut down. And I've been an entrepreneur for 10 years, you get a lot of no's. Or, yeah, but, and then you hear another kind of no. And you need to trust your vision so much, so your, ten your tenacity is, is strong. You need to be courageous, because it's, a lot of people will, will say it's not possible. So you need to have that gut feeling that this is going to work. And we're looking for that ambition in people. People who want to conquer the world and won't take no for an answer, but trust that what they are up to is important and needs to be done. And then we're looking for that, fight, that fit, as I mentioned, so what we call rocket fuel. So how can we, as a brand, deliver value to a startup and help them grow? And I'll talk a little bit about, about how we do that. And finally, skills. And this is the hardest part. Whether you're a start startup or an organization, it's all about the teams. If you don't have the right team, it's never going to work. You need to have people who can take an initial idea into a business. And for any startup, the idea you get at first is never the idea you end up with that you're making money on. You're going to pivot again and again and again. So having those teams that understands what is the feedback from the market, how can we change that pro problem we're, we're not solving right, and how can we make money on it? Having the right people is the hardest part. So we're looking for that as well. And now I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit about my role, which is uh, I'm heading our venture development department, which is the startups we invested in, getting that rocket fuel from our core out to the startups, and what I call adding value as a scale engine, because that's basically what we want to do. We want to help the companies we invest in scale. That's what we're promising them. So we offer capital on one side, and then we offer some kind of value on the other side, which we assess together with the teams. And that's also how we position ourselves as an investor. So you might have corporate partners who can help with 
buying your product as a, as a customer, and you might have traditional investors that are offering money. And we're trying to be both and offering the best of the two worlds. The way we add value is uh, through, it can be numerous things, but some of the typical areas are us as a brand alone can be of great value to a new startup. If you're going out to the world and selling something that no one has heard about, and you're a no-name company with five people somewhere in the world, it's not always that easy to break down the doors. But if you have a big brand in the back saying, we're backing this, we believe in this, it can be much easier. We also have a lot of customers. And sometimes we're on the mission, same mission as many startups. We want to help them solve their problems. And if we're not solving them, but we can provide a solution to that problem, we can also help the startups get access, get their first case, get their first customer, or maybe they're a great customer they can build more growth on. We also see ideas that are developed in an office. And uh, there's a big difference between having a desk and being on a ship with the complexity of uh, hard weather conditions or containers that are stabled in, in many, many layers, if you talk about connectivity. So we also provide access to doing the real-life pilots, where you get a lot of learnings if you, have a, if you have a gadget you want to make work. And then, of course, data. So we can save companies a lot of time if we can give them some insights where they can sh maybe skip three or five or 10 or 12 months because they know exactly what they need to know before they start developing. So how much energy consumption does it take to freight something from North America to China? How many customers are buying this product by the, in this season? Other things that are crucial to what you deliver and how you deliver it. And then our, probably the best asset we have is my 80,000 colleagues who are experts in what they do. And we have right now, we're running a food track program, and I can, I'm going to show you a bit more about that. But we have speed meetings right now. So the startups are meeting people from the core, experts who can, who can bounce with them on some of the challenges they have. And it's just so valuable to talk to a person who's actually working in that area and who has real time and real life experience from the customers and situations. And then there's all the other parts. So it's, it's just a little, a little uh, snippet of what we do. But it can be whatever the, the team needs, basically. These are some of the companies we invested in already. So Sensor Transport is an app for truck drivers that makes it possible to trace the goods. We have TeleSense, which is a little tennis ball size uh, sensor that you put in commodities. So right now it's being used for grains. And grains are stored in big silos. And today, the way you measure whether grains are good or bad, you just put the hand down and say, mm, we probably should sell this now, or ah, too late, let's skip it. So this little center, simple technology, is making sure we know exactly when to sell what in order to prevent loss. Then we have Ripe.io, which is the blockchain for food, as we call it. So it, of course, is, it's all about traceability, but also visibility. And more importantly, is authenticity, because there's a big difference. So the avocado you're buying, is it actually organic? Does it actually come from the farmer you were promised? There's a lot of, lot of, what you say, a lot of food is, or many, many mistakes is done in the food chain. A lot of people are cheating with what they're selling. So this is a way to make sure that you can actually authenticate that the things you buy is what you were promised. And then we have TradeLand, which is f formerly known as Global Trade Digitization, which, which is a collaboration together with IBM. That was a build, actually. So that's all about um, creating blockchain as an open platform where we can store information more efficiently and documentation. And LoadSmart, our recent investment, which is a digital freight forwarder service. So truck drivers can get on the platform and get matched with the demand. And then we have Spoiler Alert, which is a marketplace for food suppliers. So if, if Cisco is buying a lot of stuff and they can't really sell it, they have the second market they can sell it to. So the B2B, too good to go, you might say. And then a few others that we can't reveal right now. But this is basically what we do. So we built companies, not too many, if we can avoid it. It's only there where we have a unique opportunity or a gap in the market. And then we invest and we do partnerships as well. So we had, as I mentioned, food track at the moment. This is our second program. This is one way of engaging with startups around the world.
we have uh, sent out a challenge to uh, companies who are trying to solve food loss, and we want to work with the with the ones uh, that are, that makes sense, that matches our our criteria. So we invite them to come to Copenhagen, and and then the first batch we had almost two applicants, and we chose ten. This time they just came last week. This time we had 150 applicants and we chose seven. So they fly into Copenhagen for a month and we work very, very closely with them in order to see if there's this match in rocket fuel and if we can help them accelerate their business. So it's not a typical accelerator because they come with the product, they have the product market fit, they are making money, uh, but we're just helping them accelerate through our engine. But this is a little video from, from the food track to give you an idea on how it sounds and looks. So the program is a, is a four and a half week program that ends uh, with what we call a demo day. And a demo day is where the, the 10 startups essentially pitches not only the solution they have, but also some of the learnings they've done over the last four and a half weeks. And this is their uh, opportunity to see whether they can actually get an investment from most growth in, in, in their startups. We have invited 20 experts from all different parts of Maersk. Uh, the 10 food truck startups are having 30 minute speed meetings with them and asking all of these questions to validate their problem, their solution and getting industry insights. We did dive into concepts such as uh, uh, market needs, value proposition and we then built upon those with other elements such as go-to-market strategy, business model, capital allocation and by the end to try to articulate all those elements into uh, an investor friendly message. I think it's a wise approach. They don't go looking at hundreds of startups, but they say before we do something with them, let's have them here for a month and get to know them better. But uh, hey, it's a business and I think they are doing a good job. Partnership with Maersk seems like quite an opportunity for us as uh, Maersk is a respectful company that has distinguished goals in sustainable development. Programs like these create an environment for us to add into ourselves what we lack. Personally, I like the kind of people who are attending. They're super talented. They have their own unique problems and the solutions they're building. There are some very interesting startups. Three of the startups which we would like to make a collaboration further. Talks are going on. So let's see what happens in the future. This was from the fir first food track. And we had, as I said, 10 companies from 10 different countries. So truly global. By the end of the day, we're not waiting for technology, and that's what I'm trying to capture here. It's, it's even though I love technology, I'm, I've been working with it for a couple of decades, it, it always breaks down to, are we solving a human need? And if we can do that efficiently and, and create impact, that's where the business world and the, the sustainability world merges, and that is also part of what we are investing into. That is the future, and I think distinguishing between impact and, and good and business, today that's just merged, because where you have a lot of impact to be done, there's also typically a lot of, of money to be made as well. So it, it's just a, it's a good match in, in many ways, and that's definitely what Food Track provides as well for us. Excellent. Thank, thanks a lot, Natasha. Great. You're welcome. Thanks. Have a good day.